Welcome back to Words on Film on Boston Free Radio and Scat V. I am your host and movie critic, Dan Burke. This is the spoken word show dedicated to moving pictures, and I'm going to get right into the reviews. The first movie I'm going to be reviewing for you that, for this show is Meet the Blacks. Meet the Blacks is the latest movie starring Mike Epps, and let me just say this right off the bat, it is a very limp comedy. The movie is directed by Dion Taylor, who has, not, has directed a few movies before this one, but has not directed an actual comedy. And unfortunately, that shows. Also, Dion Taylor wrote the screenplay along with Nicole DeMasi, and the movie is about a man named Carl Black, who's an electrician, who gets the opportunity after finding some drug money from a drug dealer who's just been arrested to move his family out of the Chicago ghetto to a much more ostentatious house in Beverly Hills. However, by the time they move to Beverly Hills, they find that their timing couldn't be worse as the city has, and I think probably the country has, an annual purge where all crime is legal for 12 hours. So Meet the Blacks is, you wouldn't know it from the title, but once you hear the plot or even probably see 30 seconds of the movie, you find out it's somewhat of a thinly veiled spoof of the movie The Purge and also the sequel that came after it, after it neither of which I've actually seen. However, if you haven't seen The Purge, you probably won't be lost by th any of the plot points that go on in this movie. But the problem is not that Meet the Blacks is a parody of The Purge. I actually thought that a parody of The Purge through a black person's perspective would be an asset to this movie. But unfortunately, it doesn't really treat it as an asset. In fact, I would probably say that 98% of the jokes in this movie fall flat. I just watched this movie and chuckled a few times, but not enough really to recommend it. The only time I did chuckle was when there was a speech by the president in this movie, not President Obama, but a Latin American president played by George Lopez, who calls himself El Bama. And when George Lopez makes you laugh in a movie, you know, and nothing else does, you know the movie's pretty bad. So I just kept thinking to myself, it's, it's very easy for me to review movies that are not comedies and be able to give you my perspective about why that movie sucks. Either, you know, the story isn't told very well or the acting isn't good, but comedy is far more subjective. And I kept sitting there thinking to myself, man, this movie's bad, but I also kept thinking to myself, two days later, I'm going to have to review this movie on my show. So why is this movie bad? Well, I guess the easy way to say it is, it's not funny. But I guess to, a, to the movie's slight credit, it's not as offensive as I thought it would be. One of my biggest problems with Fifty Shades of Black, which came out a couple of months ago and is now a distant memory in a lot of moviegoers' minds, was that it stooped to the lowest possible level, to the racist junior high-like humor, which Marlon Wayans should not have been doing, or still should not be doing, at the age of 43. To meet the black's credit, it's not as racist, or at least it doesn't stoop to that low, but that's about all the credit I'm going to give it. Basically, one of the big mistakes that Meet the Blacks makes, one of the big mistakes, is it keeps dropping celebrities' names, and somehow that constitutes jokes in that movie. Let me tell you what I mean. The main character in this movie, Carl Black, is played by Mike Epps, who is obviously an African-American, and in the movie he's married to a Latina woman named Lorena, who's played by Zule Henao who is Colombian, and I guess if you squint, she might resemble Sofia Vergara, but either way, she's an attractive woman. But one of the characters in this movie refers to Carl Black as Lionel Richie, and it, I guess that's just the joke, that Lionel Richie married a white woman, and so automatically, if you just drop his name in the movie, it automatically constitutes a joke. 
that doesn't quite work that way. It's not going to get you very many laughs. There's also another character who's white, who dons a mask and breaks into the Black's mansion, wielding a chainsaw, and he just spouts off a ton of celebrities' names. He not only spouts off a lot of racist ideology, which he can do with a mask and because it's the purge and he has nothing to lose, but he keeps on saying things like, you know, your children are going to breed with my children, and the next thing you know, they're going to be a lot of Paula Pattons, and I forgot the, the other mixed-race celebrity, but going to be a lot of those people running around the neighborhood if, as if there's a bad thing. And then there's one part, and I'm not making this up, where the guy actually shouts after one of his racist tirades the name Nick Cannon. He just says, Nick Cannon! And then Mike Epps asks him very understandably, Nick Cannon, what does he have to do with anything? And the guy says, I don't know, I'm just rambling. So whenever a character actually says, I don't know, I'm just rambling after an obscure pop culture reference, you know that it's not the actor who's not trying, it's the movie that's just not trying. So Meet the Blacks is a movie that's full of randomness. I thought it was going to be a lot more racist humor than it ultimately was, but it's just random. And it's, as I said, very flaccid comedy. And the characters are so vaguely defined. Even Mike Epps' character, who's supposed to be the grounding point of this movie, just doesn't serve as a good leading man. And there's also... Uh, he, one of his kids is a 13-year-old boy who thinks he's a vampire. He has a cape and he dons these really fake Halloween fangs, but you never find out why. And once it's established that he's a vampire or he thinks he's a vampire, there's the running gag doesn't even go beyond that. It's just and even the movie tends to forget that this kid thinks he's a vampire. So Meet the Blacks has nothing new or memorable to it, and it gets my rating of a flunk out. I give it the slight credit that it didn't resort to lowbrow racist humor most of the time, but that's no excuse for the comedy just being as bad as it is. Just don't see it. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is one called The Perfect Match. This one is directed by Billy Woodruff and has a few relatively famous people in it. The lead actor in the movie, Terrence Jenkins, is not anyone who I knew, or at least who I know. The movie also co-stars, actually, a woman who is best known probably for being a singer than an actress. Her name is Cassie Ventura, and she is known for being a one-hit wonder. She had a hit ten years ago under uh, P. Diddy's or Diddy's um, Bad Boy label. It was, it was Me and You, which was a minor hit during the summer of 2006. But after that song, we hadn't heard from her, or at least I hadn't heard from her, until this movie came out. So The Perfect Match is a movie about a playboy named Charlie, who's played by Terrence Jenkins, who is convinced that all his relationships are dead, mainly because he doesn't try, and he meets the beautiful and mysterious Eva, played by Cassie Ventura. Agreeing to a casual affair, Charlie then wants a bit more from their relationship. So this movie, believe it or not, is a comedy, even though it sounds like a melodrama. And The Perfect Match actually bears a strong resemblance plot-wise to Eddie Murphy's 1992 movie Boomerang. The only thing is, Boomerang was funny, and this movie was just not very memorable. The thing that really is wrong with The Perfect Match is may not necessarily be the acting, but it's just the characters are not very inspired. Terrence Jenkins is likable enough, I guess, but he's actually kind of bland, especially considering he's a playboy, and he just doesn't want to be in a relationship because it's one of his rules, and this is actually something he says in the movie. He's able to get beautiful women to go to his luxurious mansion, which at the age of 29, which he actually is in the movie, it's astounding that he can live in such a place like that. But he does well as a photographer. Where I didn't actually get what he did for a living. I know he worked for a company, but I'm not sure exactly what he did. The movie didn't explain very well. 
he does, I mean, he is um, skilled in photography, but it's not clear within the movie whether he is a photographer for a living or if he does it just as a side business. It's just not really clear right here. But the movie looks really good. It has some really good cinematography. Everybody in the movie looks great, but there's nothing really original to it, not even in terms of the plot. I, w I will say that the one thing about the plot that actually threw me for a loop was the twist involving this seemingly perfect woman, Eva. Y you find out, you, you assume that she's single, but then, and yeah, I'm kind of spoiling here, but I don't know what else to say without spoiling the movie. Charlie eventually finds her being fit for a wedding gown. And when I saw that, I thought to myself, okay, that's a relatively clever twist. But is that so much of a twist that it's going to ruin the movie for you? I don't think so, but I'm trying to tread very carefully on spoilers. I usually do on this show. But the rest of the characters are just so unoriginal. In fact, you have, you know, Terrence Jenkins' character who is a guy who is very good with the ladies and not an asshole, fortunately, but he has this fear of commitment. And then he has this one friend who's married and has some problems with his wife, despite the fact that both of them are gorgeous looking. And then you have an another friend who is in a committed relationship but is afraid to take that next step. And that is just the that's just the blueprint of romantic comedies from a guy's perspective. There's nothing really original there. The only really original character in this movie was Charlie's sister, Sherry, who's a psychologist, played by Paula Patton. Paula Patton is normally a great actress, and she's probably the best actress in this movie, basically because she's not a cardboard character. There are scenes in this movie where she's trying to get... Charlie to open up. She's trying to play psychologist. And I thought those scenes were probably amongst the most original scenes in the movie, or at least the most memorable. There's also another scene where one of Charlie's clients is this uh, diva singer whose name is Avashia, and she's played by Brandy Norwood. And Brandy, even though she's given near top billing in this movie, only makes a cameo in this film, but the time where she's in the movie, which only amounts to about two minutes, is actually quite funny. So she plays a diva, and she plays someone who's a little full of the new age uh, garbage, I guess you could call it, that she has this mantra where she cannot allow her feet to touch the ground for an hour a day. So rather than lying on a couch, she actually has a bodyguard who brings her, who brings her into Charlie's office. I thought that part was brief, but I actually thought that was pretty funny. Other than that, I just felt like the perfect match, which was actually released in the theaters, but it's not there anymore, but it pulled in a relatively decent nine million dollars, but on what budget, I don't know, probably no more than 15 million. I just felt as though the perfect match would have been better suited as a made-for-TV movie on BET or TV One than in theaters, because there really isn't a lot of substance to this movie. I suppose the people in the movie are likable, but everybody with the exception of Paula Patton and Brandy Norwood are just bland. So the perfect match is not nearly as bad as Meet the Blacks, some of the material works, most of it doesn't. It's a good-looking film, but I have to give it a, my rating of a strikeout because it really treads into very, very familiar territory. It has taken the road most taken rather than the road not taken. It should have been a lot more original. I can't give it any higher recommendation than that. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you for this show is Eye in the Sky. This is the latest movie that came out this year in the States, but it is actually listed on IMDb as having come out in 2015, which I hope doesn't mean that it's not qualified for the Oscars next year, but 
Then again, considering it's released so early in the year, it might be forgotten about by the time the next Oscars come about. But I really hope that it doesn't get forgotten about because it's notable for a couple of things. Well, one thing in particular. It's one of Alan Rickman's last movies. Alan Rickman, as you may or may not know, as you probably know, died early this year on January 14th, unfortunately, at the age of 69, which, by sheer coincidence, is the same age that Davey, David Bowie died just about a week earlier. So, Alan Rickman's in this movie along with Helen Mirren, Aaron Paul, and also, my God, how long has it been since we've heard from this guy, Barkhad Abdi. Now, Barkhad Abdi is not a household name by any means, but he's best known for his Academy Award nominated performance in the movie Captain Phillips, where he played a Somali pirate opposite Tom Hanks. And that was a great movie, and Barkhad Abdi did great in that movie. I was just hoping that when I saw Captain Phillips, I was really hoping this wouldn't be the last I saw of Barkhad Abdi, but fortunately, with Eye in the Sky, it is not. So what is Eye in the Sky about? It is about Colonel Catherine Powell, who is a mil military officer, a British military officer, in command of an operation to capture terrorists in Kenya, sees her mission escalate when a girl enters the kill zone, triggering an international dispute over the implications of modern warfare. So, Eye in the Sky is very much a movie of this time. It could take place, well, right now. And the, the movie is about British and American intelligence units who are monitoring a terrorist group that's very much like Al-Qaeda, but not named Al-Qaeda in this movie. So, the, the movie shows literally an Eye in the Sky that is a hovercraft viewing these terrorists at work at a remote neighborhood in Kenya. And they see that their plans go from conspiring to actually strapping bombs to their chest and potentially committing a terrorist act in another more heavily populated area. But the movie really takes you in with this perspective from the people who are trying to decide when to execute, and the people who are monitoring this hovercraft, for lack of a better term, and determining when exactly to push the button to drop the bomb. Things get really complicated, however, as I said from the plot description, when a Kenyan girl who is selling bread nearby, obviously oblivious to the terrorist activity that's going on in a building next to her, begins to disrupt the plans of the military intelligence officers. So there are various plans that the CIA and the special ops in Britain and the United States, primarily in Britain, have to get this Kenyan girl out of the way so they can bomb this building and the terrorists inside won't be able to carry out their plans of even more destruction than the military operations are planning to do. So this is a nail biter. This is a movie with some great acting by just about everyone involved, and it raises some serious questions about warfare in general. Obviously, the military advantage that the British and American military operations have in this movie, or rather in general, are evident, but the point of the movie is not the advantages that these military units have, it's what the ramifications are of dropping the bomb. And it's reminded me very much of, without the military ideology, a movie in which Gene Hackman starred, directed by Francis Ford Coppola, which I believe is called The Conversationalist. And that's a movie also about monitoring activity via a camera and also specialized activity. The only difference between The Conversationalist and Eye in the Sky is The Conversationalist did not have the subplot of somebody dropping a bomb. But I loved every minute of Eye in the Sky, or at least, well, 
I'm not going to tell you how the movie turns out, whether the, the, the bomb is dropped and exactly who gets killed. That would be ruining it for you. In fact, I, I just can't ruin anything about this movie. And I have about a minute and a half left until my next break, so I'm not sure exactly what to say about the movie that I haven't already said. But I'll tell you this early on, it gets my rating of a knockout. And I really hope that it gets the attention it deserves next, next Oscar season. But as I said, given it's released so early in this year, it may not get the attention it deserves. However, I really hope that an organization like the Criterion Collection gives it a DVD release. And I hope that more people get to see this movie than are already seeing it right now. Eye in the Sky is one of those movies that's opening up in, a, or is open, in a lot of independent theaters, but not so much the multiplex theaters, and I really hope that changes. It's up against Batman vs. Superman and Zootopia, and it may not stand a chance against those movies. Fair enough. But it's a movie that's intense, it is thrilling, but in the end it also makes you think. And it also... I'm not sure if it really makes you more or less appreciative of the job that the that military operations do, whether on ground zero or in the sky, but it definitely makes you aware of some of the life or death decisions they have to make in these kind of situations, which they probably face every day, and Eye in the Sky is more than memorable for that. The next movie I'm going to be reviewing for you is one called Remember. This is a movie starring Christopher Plummer and a number of other uh, noteworthy actors. Although you don't see a lot of movies these days with actors over 80, but this movie has two, Christopher Plummer and Martin Landau. And I do have to say that if Christopher Plummer dies tomorrow, and let's hope he doesn't, but hypothetically speaking, if he does, Remember might be... I think would be a fitting last movie for him before he dies. But I don't want to worry you guys who are fans of, uh, of Christopher Plummer because I think he's a great actor too. I like him in a lot of stuff he's in. And I'm just saying that Remember is one of those movies that I hope you actually do remember if you get a chance to see it. This is another movie like Eye in the Sky that's credited as being from 2015. And for that reason, may not probably will not get any attention during the Oscar season. It may not even be eligible for Oscars next year based on the fact that, according to IMDb, its U.S. release date is, or was, December 17th. But I actually saw it in theaters just two weeks ago, and if you find it at a theater near you, I hope you see it. Remember is about, well, let me just give you the plot summary. With the aid of a fellow Auschwitz survivor and a handwritten letter, an elderly man with dementia goes in search of the person responsible for the death of his family. The Auschwitz survivor with dementia is the, actor, is the part played by Christopher Plummer. His name is Zev Gutman, and his friend, who's a fellow Auschwitz survivor, is Max Rosenbaum, who in this movie is played by Martin Landau. So the movie is... It starts out relatively slow. You see these two guys in the nursing home. You obviously see that Christopher Plummer's character has some major memory problems. And it is risky for him to, well, he's actually not allowed to leave his assisted living facility where he stays with this fellow Auschwitz survivor, Max Rosenbaum. And once he does leave, his family is understandably alerted immediately. But you're rooting for this guy to find the Nazi soldier in hiding who was one of his chief tormentors, or at least allegedly, at Auschwitz. And it actually is kind of scary when you... The, the film itself isn't scary. It's quite thrilling. But it is shocking to think that even in 2016, 70 years after World War II ended, that there are still Nazi soldiers who successfully escaped and changed their name and resided 
in the United States. It's, it's a scary thought. I mean, I'm sure there were a lot of them found in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, but the fact that they're still out there today is quite terrifying. Not that they'd necessarily... Well, I'm, I'm just going to move on. But remember, has Zev go from place to place, various parts of the United States and Canada, and actually find various people who he thinks is the soldier who, or the Nazi soldier who tormented him and his friend during Auschwitz. But he finds one person who actually used to be a Nazi soldier, but was stationed in Africa for a little while. And then he finds other people who have since passed on, who may not have been Nazi soldiers, but Nazi sympathizers. And just like Eye in the Sky, this is a movie that I have three more minutes to talk about, but I'm completely out of things to say, mainly because I don't want to spoil anything. What, what else can I say about this movie? Basically, you're rooting for Zev, Christopher Plummer, throughout the entire movie. There are parts where you really fear for him when his life is in danger. There are other actors in this movie who do incredibly well, but Christopher Plummer is the actor who keeps this movie grounded. And Martin Landau, even though he's in the movie for probably a total of 10 minutes, also does well in his role. It's just a much smaller role. And the ending is a jaw dropper. That's all I will have to say about it. All I can say is it is very shocking. And once you leave the movie theater, you find that even though the movie starts out really slow, the ending is well worth the wait. And I think that I already said everybody in this movie does really well. It tells a great story, and it's actually written by a screenwriter named Benjamin August, who wrote both the story and the screenplay. And if you can believe it, Benjamin August actually has a variety of credits on IMDb. He's acted in two TV movies. This is actually the first movie he ever wrote. But before writing this movie, he was actually, and I'm not making this up, a casting director on the TV show Fear Factor. Yes, the reality show Fear Factor, where people do crazy stunts like putting their head in a glass case and having scorpions dropped into that case. It's, it's crazy. He also produced, produced excuse me, a few episodes of Fear Factor and also another one called another game show called Don't Forget the Lyrics. So this is a guy you would not expect to write a riveting screenplay, but amazingly, he did. And I probably would have expected a movie like this to be written by somebody around Christopher Plummer's age, and I'm not sure exactly where the inspiration behind the movie was, but all I can say is I was mesmerized by it. And thankfully, I have 45 seconds left, so I'm not rambling on as much as I usually think I am. But Remember gets my rating of a knockout. It doesn't have a very memorable title, despite being called Remember. It's just, it seems like a very common title, but make no mistake about it. This is not a common movie. In fact, I think, I, I can't really say whether movies are going to be remembered years from now. I'd like to think they deserve to be, but I really hope that Remember deserves to be. And as I said before, if Christopher Plummer or Martin Landau dies tomorrow, this movie will probably be a cementing their legacy. But in the meantime, that's all for Words on Film for this week. I'm Dan Burke, your host and movie critic. It's been great reviewing movies for you, actually talking movies with you for this show. And, as usual, until next week, I'll see you at the movies.